Welcome to another edition of the Best Business Minds, where we interview business leaders and academics that write thought-provoking books. I'm Mark Kramer, a serial entrepreneur who consults with family businesses and entrepreneurs. Welcome today, Jonathan Lippman and Susanna Camp, authors of The Entrepreneur's Faces and How Makers, Visionaries, and Outsiders Succeed. Great to have you both here. Thanks, Thank Mark. Thank you, Mark. It's great to be here. Thanks to everybody for joining. So what I'd like you to do first is, uh, Susanna and John, uh, tell us a little bit about each of your backgrounds. Sure, I uh, started writing about tech and I wrote two big books about computer hackers, notorious computer hackers, Kevin Mitnick, one of them. And then I had a bit of serendipity. I ended up writing and collaborating on two major books with IDEO. Some of you may know uh, a famous innovation design thinking firm out in Stanford and uh, did a lot of that, uh, worked for Playboy, crazy stories for Playboy and all kinds of things, the sports and ended up teaching entrepreneurship. And that's actually how I met Susanna. And I was a journalist, I am a journalist and I uh, was at Wired Magazine very early on. I was also at Macworld and PC World. I have a huge network of techie, entrepreneurial friends, many of whom were there with me in those early wired days when we were building one of the first websites in the world and one of the biggest uh, social communities. Well, John, I want to come back and live your life working at Playboy. That sounds like a great job. <laughs> <laughs> I did go to some crazy sports events, but uh, I was usually sometimes writing about the bad guys. Uh, but that's another story. <laughs> did you work with Maury Levy by any chance? No, I, I, I didn't. I worked with Bob Love, uh, Chris Napolitano. Oh, yes, uh, sure. Yeah, I, I wrote a lot about uh, steroids and the crazy steroids days of uh, Barry Bonds and all that, all that wide stuff. Now you're starting to date all of us here that are listening to this. <laughs> So I really enjoyed your book, and I'm sure uh, this book should actually be a must-have at colleges for people who aspire to be entrepreneurs. So I'm expecting at some point that you'll be telling us that your book is actually in uh, many of the entrepreneurial programs around the country. So uh, my first question to you is, how has entrepreneurship uh, changed because of COVID? Yeah, well, we wrote The Entrepreneur's uh, Faces because we believe in entrepreneurship. And I think COVID has proved that belief out. Uh, there have been more companies started in the US in the last several months than in, in the last 12 years. There's been a huge growth. Um, a lot of the people who may have lost a job or lost a good position or perhaps um, they uh, got some stimulus money, they started a company. And, and they did this because the old models, many of the old models fell apart. Um, it wasn't such a great thing to have a restaurant or a classic store. And so there was this extra impetus to start a company. And we see that actually accelerating in 21. Now, do you find that happens every time there's a downturn in the market like 2008? They said that was a great year for people starting businesses. It's a great point. Uh, we actually uh, write a lot about Europe and have been to Europe many times. And there was a great opportunity in Europe where the downturn was even larger, you know, in 2009, 10, even into 11. And, and yes, it's when companies play it safe and entrepreneurs take chances. And that's why there can be a huge upside. Um, from your research, what are the key traits of successful entrepreneurs? Well, we would say openness to new ideas and approaches, uh, a, a sort of natural inclination to be creative, to do rather than plan and to prototype making things, whether those are prototypes of physical products or digital products or even sales models. We, we find that entrepreneurs are okay with ambiguity. They can handle the ambiguity of not always knowing whether the first iteration of a product will be the winning one. Not, not always knowing whether they found the right customer at the beginning. And so that's very important as well. 
And are, are people born entrepreneurs or, you know, is it, or can they be taught it? I mean, what's your, from all these entrepreneurs you've interviewed, were these people naturally, I, I, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I never even wanted to be an entrepreneur. I'm the, I'm the I forget which chapter that is, but I, I'm the reluctant entrepreneur. I never <laughs> planned for it. And my father was a business owner. My grandfather was a business owner, but I just did it at a necessity. So I created my own job and I've been doing it ever since. Well, Mark, you're probably the type that we would call the accidental entrepreneur. Uh, that said, some people do naturally have more of the entrepreneurial mindset, but we think it can also be learned. We teach a class together at the University of San Francisco called Creativity, Innovation, and Applied Design. The class itself combines mini lectures, very little lecture time, uh, with experiential learning, so learning by doing. And in this class, we don't assign case studies, but instead have our students design products, brainstorm new ideas, and uh, pitch their work in front of the class. And we found that by the end of the class, the, as they've told us, they've learned a lot more about how to look at the world and be more innovative. Yeah, I, I was wondering, you know, from uh, reading all the chapters and you had some great examples of folks that you interviewed, uh, and, and they had great stories themselves and, and relatable stories, you know, not the Steve Jobs, Google or, or Facebook, you know, or Facebook stories, but very relatable stories. Yes, no billionaires in this book. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that was intentional. I, yeah. A lot of times the uh, publisher, I've written six books, doesn't like that because they think <laughs> that other stuff sells. But I actually think what you do is what people can connect with. What did you learn when you asked uh, the question of tapping the most innovative and entrepreneurial people? What was the things that uh, stuck out to you most? Well, the best entrepreneurs know how to tell their story. So what they'll do is embrace their inner evangelist. The evangelist is one of our types who's a really great storyteller and knows how to move people's hearts and minds and sort of tap into that emotional component. Uh, these people are passionate about their product uh, the way, in the way that they have to be to bring it to market and they'll also take this conviction and, and channel it into leadership. We also find they <clears throat> tend to be makers. A maker is the person who prototypes, um, who can do quick iterations instead of planning and writing a business plan. Another type, uh, which actually is my type, um, uh, many entrepreneurs have an element of, is the athlete. And they love competition. They love crazy deadlines and uh, they don't like things to be the same every week and that's something you can count on with a startup. Uh, from your research, is it better to uh, partner or to go it alone? Well, uh, venture capitalists, especially in Silicon Valley, even angels, they really tend to prefer co-founders and, and partly that's because it's such a rough journey and you need somebody else to buck you up and we believe with our types also, you need someone who has different skills that, you know, one of you might be a maker and one of you might be, as Susanna described, more of the evangelist. So soul founders generally have a, a rough go of it. Um, it's not that there aren't uh, soul founders. And we also find that, you know, very quickly you wanna build in these other types. You want this diversity of talent and mindset. Um, some other types are the visionary, the outsider to get new ideas into your company. That, that diversity is really key in sort of defining the kinds of empathy that you need to really meet your customers' needs. And if you think about it, if you are your own first customer, you need to make sure that you've got a broad range of interests or you're going to leave out some people's needs and miss whole sectors of, of customers that you could get. And that's why it's, it's great to pair with complementary types who can help you reach more people. Yeah, I'm gonna ask you a question later about diversity, but on, on the partnership side, I, I've, I've had partners that have been fantastic. Um, they carried the same load that I was and I've had partners who were not good partners 
uh, and I ended up doing most of the work, even though we had the same share of stock. Mm -hmm. And I, I was the founder in all these cases. What do you suggest to entrepreneurs who are thinking of partnering with someone? How should they evaluate their partners? Potential it's, partners. It's, it's, you're, you're absolutely right. It's a great question. And, you know, there are successful marriages and divorces, right? And, and sometimes it's almost worse than a divorce because you have to keep doing everything, as you mentioned. So it's something you want to vet, um, you know, with, uh, we're actually writing a story right now about coaching and mentoring, which has grown hugely here in, in Silicon Valley. So this is something to be discussing at length with your mentor or your coach. Um, and you, you generally want to start thinking about tasks and, and things that you're going to have to do as you grow. And hopefully your partner will bring other elements that you might not be quite as skilled at. So, but if you founded the company, like it's your idea, do you think you should hold the majority of the stock? And if you bring in a partner, should they get some equity in the beginning and earn out uh, the rest over time? I mean, as a way to protect yourself, because I found that one of my ventures, it was a, a, a total mistake on my part to give my partner the same equity. I mean, he had been with me on, the, on this. And then once we got started, he wasn't able to really deliver. And then after he wasn't able to deliver, the, the investor said, love you, don't love your partner. We want to get him out of there. And they, and they didn't want to pay him a payout. They would let him keep his stock. But he insisted on the cash, you know, covering his salary and so forth. And, and that eventually, the investors just said, we're not going to do this anymore. And that was the end of the company. So how do you protect yourself against uh, a partner that you think is going to work out but doesn't? And, you're, and it's your idea. Uh, these are good questions. I mean, there are, you know, very good lawyers, very good VCs and angels who know the ins and outs of these, of these contracts and how you negotiate it. And you're absolutely right. You don't necessarily have to give up 50% of the company um, for a co-founder or an early uh, partner. And I just think that this is something that you should take some time with. Um, it, it, it's similar to what we were talking about a moment ago with mentoring and coaching. You're not going to immediately pick a coach for six months or a year. You're going to test that out for a bit. And obviously with a co-founder, that should be tested out probably over months. Um, and uh, there are, like with anything, there are, you know, uh, negative stories, but I think they're in, in, in balance, there are many more cases of co-founders uh, being successful than a sole founder. Should you do a background check on your co-founder? or How do you go about looking into their background? Because oftentimes I, I've met people who partner with people that they met in class or that they met through work and they partner with them. They only know them in that aspect, but they really don't know them uh, in a sense. So what do you recommend? Because that's that could blow up. I've worked with lots of businesses that have blown up over bad partnerships, like you said, bad marriages. Well, it's a great question. Actually, by chance, um, I'm moving to a houseboat, a beautiful houseboat in Sausalito. And the amount of backroom check uh, for <laughs> taking a lease <laughs> to move to a house, a houseboat is phenomenal. And I bet most founders don't do that amount of checking. And, and you should, and there's a way to do it in a legitimate, transparent way. Um, and you're absolutely right, because not everybody is above board and, and people may have fudged things and there may be things you need to know about your co-founder. People don't realize that when you write a book, it's like launching a new venture. And so you two launched a new venture with this particular book. What, what kind of due diligence or how did you two can, connect and decide we could co-author a book together because that's a lot of work. We've been working together for years. We've been collaborating for starters on our website, smartup.life, where we write a weekly story about innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, so five years of weekly stories really adds up and we were able to sort of test out how well we work together we also travel in the same circles, of course. We, as we're 
beginning to write the book, we were out at events all the time, meeting people in San Francisco and learning that there were many times coming from other places and we wanted to go out into the world and meet them where they were coming from. So we traveled together. Now traveling is also another test of metal to see how, how well you fit with a particular person. Uh, traveling and writing together and meeting people and interviewing hundreds of entrepreneurs really tested out that concept for us. I think that's a good idea because my daughter said that about my girlfriend. <laughs> she said, <laughs> and before you decide, you should uh, take her away for a week. And two years later, we're still together. So it must right. have worked out. I, I wanted to know this, and this was a question from the audience here. Do you know much about restricted stock and how it works? So you may be able to explain that concept. Uh, you know, I don't think we're probably the right expert for, for that particular uh, story. So I would suggest contacting an attorney, a corporate attorney, and they can walk you through that. Yeah. Is there a, a certain amount of experience that enhances your chances of success? Because I think most people think of entrepreneurs as being uh, under 30 years old, but the vast majority from studies I've seen are actually, I think the average age is what, 51 for entrepreneurs I've seen in different studies. So does it matter or does it depend on the industry that you have a certain amount of experience before you decide to go off and do your own thing? Well, Mark, you're absolutely right on your statistics. Uh, you know, people in their 40s and 50s and even 60s tend to be much more successful on average than someone in their mid 20s or mid 30s. And part of that is they likely had success um, in a, a corporate career or, or in a business. They likely know more about uh, you know, gaining capital, gaining investors, they may have some of their own capital to invest. Um, VCs um, intend to like people who have either had success, obviously, with, with the startup, or actually who have failed uh, in a good way. Uh, so so they, they may have had an interesting company, but the business model maybe didn't work out. But they went through all these steps which are so diametrically different from a traditional business. And that's why, you know, actually a VC may like someone who failed twice before because they actually, they, they've been through the war. They know the battles, they, they, they know how difficult it is and they know the many elements that are necessary to be successful. Do you think that uh, investors are looking at entrepreneurs differently now than they did, let's say, 10, 20 years ago, or even, you know, would say within the last 30 years and how they're evaluating which entrepreneurs they want to invest in? I think it, it matters very much what uh, city and country you're in. I think clearly here in Silicon Valley, there's been a shift toward companies, you know, with, you know, a bigger TAM, you know, a, a bigger, you know, scale um, and, and you've seen this in the statistics also in that there are larger rounds. So they're more likely to make a bigger bet with something that has that greater potential. And I think that's clearly grown in the last few years. Are there specific skills or what is the skill set entrepreneurs need to have right now in order to master these uncertain times? And are there any skills particularly important at the moment navigating through this crisis? I'd say, you know, one big skill clearly is th this, this maker mindset we talked about, this, this, this prototyping, this fast iteration. We, in our book, uh, we'll talk more about this maybe as we go on, but we wrote a lot about Stanford Launchpad, which is a college and university accelerator. And actually it's only 10 weeks long. And what they really focus on is sales, which is kind of interesting because it, often startups uh, ignore the importance of, of sales. They think, well, we'll just keep getting more investment and keep getting, we'll get more users. But they actually, in this class, which is really an incubator, they make them sell. And we, we find that, you know, especially in other markets, if you get out of Silicon Valley, you have to actually have revenue and you, and you have to know how to prototype and iterate quickly different ways to sell your product. So I think that's something that 
really has grown uh, during the crisis. I, I would say too, if we're, if we're really talking about the pandemic in particular, uh, you have to be ready to pivot. You have to be bold enough to take a risk. Uh, sometimes the risk is low. You don't have a, that much to lose if you've already lost most of your business during the pandemic anyway. But uh, we've seen some great examples, some great stories of people like bakers and restaurant owners who, who pivot to online sales and e-commerce. Yeah, I always like um, in Gone with the Wind, uh, Rhett Butler always says the greatest opportunity is in difficult times. And so that's where, where fortunes are made. And so if people can make those adjustments, they end up being the winners at the end of the day. <clears throat> Very true. 2020 was actually a great year for business growth. Yeah, and the market seemed to held up in the beginning. I think investors, uh, we had Tim Draper on and he was telling entrepreneurs in the beginning, like in April, you'll probably have to take a 60% haircut in your valuation. But I don't think that ended up holding true because the market ended up uh, holding up throughout this whole process. And I think it's because the type of businesses that, weren't, that were affected not, right. it, it wasn't industries per se, like manufacturing or whatever. In right. fact, See, they were really humming. Some people were going two, three shifts. Yeah, and Mark, to, to build on what you just mentioned, you know, clearly what's happened in this year, and it looks like we're going to have another six months to another year of pandemic, is we're making a shift that was going to happen in a decade in two years. So, so we are making a shift to you know, a new world where work will always be on some level hybrid, where there's going to be a lot of dis distributed and remote work, where the, where the growth in, in how we learn online, how we collaborate. Um, I'm a big fan of, of enhancing our uh, collaborative mastery with other individuals and with other teams and working on some projects there. I think we're going to see the growth of something um, completely new, which is called the digital culture of a company. Which, which hasn't really taken hold yet. We talk about the great culture, say at Apple or Pixar or some of these iconic companies. All these companies are having to build a new digital culture and the ones who do that first are gonna draw great talent and investment. And, you know, you've seen um, Facebook and some others allowing people to work from wherever they are in the country, but they're also changing their salary. So the people who thought, I'm, I'm gonna take my Silicon Valley salary and move to Iowa and be able to stack up a bunch of money and buy a really big house. And then the companies are changing that model as well for what they're going to pay them because they're paying them saying, hey, if you live in Iowa, we're going to pay Iowa wages. Huh. Have you noticed any effect on companies and how employees respond to that? Well, actually, one of the stages in our book, we think you go through uh, seven stages. You start with an awakening. And actually, our third stage in, in your growth as an entrepreneur is place. And we think place matters. You know, we think it matters online. And so online now, you have to create a new place, a new network of collaborators and colleagues. But I would not advocate moving to Iowa right now. Uh, that is not the place you're going to probably tap into the newest opportunities. And so we think that the physical place is still going to matter, but you're going to have to build up both of these places. And we think some people are making short-sighted decisions about moving because it still matters who you know, who you're connected to, how early you get on a new wave of opportunity. Yeah, and don't no. underestimate the value of a socially distanced coffee with somebody in your network who, where that, where that face to face, even with a mask on, can really establish a better, a better rapport, a better rapport, and help you get to what your answers more quickly if you're if you're meeting with them for something that you need. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I see people coming back to offices, I think, without the physical presence of being able to go off to the side with somebody or, or catch up with them, you know, doing a run, a bike ride, whatever that may be. 
And but there are a lot of folks moving from Silicon Valley to Texas. Is Texas going to be the epicenter for entrepreneurship? Uh, do you think? I mean, or will be everybody, not just Silicon Valley, but around the country, because there's no state income tax and their corporate yeah. taxes. Are yeah. Well, I think Mark Twain said, you know, my death has been greatly exaggerated. Yeah. And, and we believe San Francisco's demise has been greatly exaggerated. Um, you know, I, I once did some writing, historical writing about San Francisco, and we have survived, you know, a great earthquake, two fires that took the whole city. We rose up in the gold rush, the silver rush. Um, a huge percentage of the world's venture capital is here in talent. And yes, some people are going to places where they will save money on state taxes and so forth. But if you look under the hood, you'll find out there isn't the same level of, of VC um, investment by any means. And more importantly, there isn't the record of entrepreneurship. And Austin is a beautiful place and it may be great for people, but it just doesn't compare in terms of entrepreneurship. Yeah, I'm lost about, I've been to Austin, I'm not getting it. Uh, so <laughs> I'm not one of those people that sees, you know, I think it has some nice nightlife, but in terms of attracting and having that workforce that Silicon Valley offers, I just don't, I just don't see that. And so, and I don't think anybody over time, because in Pennsylvania, they're always complaining, we need to lower corporate taxes to attract and retain companies. And I said, all you have to do is look at Silicon Valley, the taxes are way higher out in California, <laughs> and yet the engine has been humming along for yeah, over 50 I, years. I, I say some, some smaller ecosystems do have value in terms of being able to support some of the talent and, um, tech talent in particular that can feed some of those new ventures. Uh, Portugal, for example, is can be a great place to uh, co to relocate your your company to some extent and get some get some great engineering there that we found these hubs all over the world. At the same time, people still come to Silicon Valley to do these pilgrimages and find out more about the Silicon Valley mindset. And that, we don't think that that was going to change. Yeah, and we'd even add um, Santa Barbara uh, is, uh, I think it's 350 miles from San Francisco. And it has this great uh, lifestyle. This is another place, if I were to leave San Francisco, I would rather go to Santa Barbara because you could be in San Francisco for a meeting um, you know, in five hours. And they have a huge number of SaaS companies that have a, a few, um, you know, over a billion in value. So there are smaller cities, as Susanna mentioned, but I think you have to be very strategic about it. And you don't want to lose your network. Like, obviously, New York is, is, is going to continue to be a huge place. So is, you know, Boston and Cambridge um, and San Francisco as well. Uh, what advice do you have for SME service industry businesses on the back of what's happened in 2020? What should be the lesson for those businesses to learn from this pandemic? Well, you know, we we saw such a shift. I mean, we saw, uh, we were going to talk about this earlier, just a quick little example of maybe it's fun. A bakery here in San Francisco, um, you know, they their business was shut down and the 29 year old owner was not technical but he dove into to becoming tech he turned all of his bakers um actually into designers and and working in a um, warehouse and they created these beautiful online products and just it's almost instantly in a month actually went 3x if not 5x of their old business and so what seems to be happening is companies really are having to go if not fully online you know certainly in a hybrid and it matters what quality you have it matters the quality of the content the quality of the design um, the offering uh, i think what we've shown is you can't be average i mean if, if you're a business and, and you try to go online with something that's average, well, there are a lot of more efficient uh, companies that will beat you out. No question. 
I, I wonder this in your research, uh, not just for this book, but in general, as you're doing your teaching, are there any differences between women and men entrepreneurs? It's, it's a great question, Mark. And uh, I'm gonna uh, tread lightly here. Uh, I don't wanna alienate people, but I would say that men tend to be a bit better at telling their stories with confidence. And maybe this is because of uh, sort of implicit bias in society that men are, are more encouraged and validated throughout their lives and, and just feel more confident in general. But that is a, it's a, it's a big, it is a difference and it's a big boost uh, to get out there and have that kind of self-awareness and confidence that you need to uh, attract the angels and uh, VCs who are going to help you scale because they are convinced by your story. With our book, we hope to instill that confidence in, in people, men and women alike, uh, for, to help people get out there and embrace their inner superpowers that they can find by uh, detecting, detecting what their, their archetype is through experience. Uh, Adam Grant in his book, Originals, I love this book, uh, Originals, suggests starting part-time may be the smartest way to go. W what's your thoughts on that? Uh, good question. We're writing a story about this actually right now. Uh, some people call this the side hustle. So let's say you have a good job, uh, but you have this dream, uh, you know, maybe you have a co-founder or a partner who starts coding something uh, or, or creating some sort of uh, website. And, you know, usually it's very risky to leave that great job, to leave, you know, the benefits, to leave that security. So a lot of what people do is they will talk to mentors, they'll talk to coaches, and they will advise them to build that up. And that means it's true. You're going to be working 1.3 jobs or 1.4 jobs at the same time because you're building up this other business. And, and then it's a question of scale. If it really takes off, then you may feel confident enough to let go and, and to jump on this, you know, thundering new horse. But in other cases, you may keep it going. Uh, we, we actually know quite a few people in San Francisco who were sort of inveterate sort of tinkerers and they have lots of little ventures and most of them were not big, but every once in a while, something would turn into something larger. So we, we really think there's um, a value in proving out the concept with customers and, and with uh, traction. I have to say that uh, I, I really, the part you had mentioned before about these accelerators having entrepreneurs focus on sales I can't agree with them more because I think most entrepreneurs, especially technical ones, get so enamored with their idea that they never really see if anybody actually wants to buy whatever they're selling. And I think a lot of people even hate the thought of actually asking anybody to buy it. They love the idea of <laughs> developing, writing the plan, and then it's like, okay, now you got to take the leap. Uh, it really saves you a lot of pain. Don't you agree uh, that if you go out right away and see if people want to buy it or say they'll say, give a letter of commitment. I once time started uh, a financial service venture and the VCs just ask, just get letters of commitment. We don't need them to buy it. We just need to get letters of commitment Correct. Uh, to it. So what, what, what's your further thoughts on, you know, the need to see if somebody will buy it before you go too deep in? Well, we do agree with you that sales is a really important skill to and, and, and mindset to have when you're going out there with your product. We found as we traveled around the world that not all cultures are equally skilled at sales. Uh, we went to Poland, for example, and we met a lot of great technical people, great deep tech uh, entrepreneurs who had business ideas but they couldn't necessarily get to market because they didn't have the kinds of um, the, that sort of sales uh, mojo that you need to pour to pour on in, um, when you wanna market your product and get out there. Uh, we also 
we developed a little bit of a technique when we went to trade shows, uh, like conferences. We went to the Web Summit in Portugal, which is a 60,000 person show. We go to CES, or we did back when we could actually go live to CES, which is huge. And uh, we wanted to kind of vet people and find out who we were, who, who might have a successful venture. So rather than have people approach us with their pitch, we would go up to people and, and uh, give them the framework for a pitch that we wanted to hear. And that pitch asked them for uh, not only what was, what was their product, how would you describe it quickly, uh, what is the sort of special sauce that they're bringing? How, you know, who are their competitors quickly? But how are you going to sell it? How are you going to sell that product? What is your approach to getting money fast? Yeah, and a lot of people say, well, we're going to sell it to enterprise. And we'd say, how? <laughs> who? You know, you know so, so you're absolutely right. Um, if there's one huge thing we think should be taught in high school and in college is is selling products. And at Stanford Launchpad, they had this wonderful sort of exercise midway through the course where the, the students had already attempted to sell their product by five weeks in. And they came to class that day with all the ingredients to make and sell lemonade. And so they played this little contest where they, the, the team that would make the most money would take all the money from all the teams. And it was phenomenal because in that day you would find out who had, as Susanna mentioned, the sales mojo. Uh, when you're a, a team made $3,000 selling lemonade and took in the other two grand. Um, and so you could just see this in real time. So this is something we would, we would advocate as well. Uh, which area do you see as hot areas in Silicon Valley today where investments are flowing? Mm. It's, a, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, we've seen, you know, we have friends who are VCs. There's clearly been money in gaming, um, different versions of gaming. We um, know one that recently went public here. Um, you know, obviously there, there's, uh, there, there are going to be opportunities. We think in different kinds of, um, of online learning. Uh, you know, this uh, Susanna is uh, can tell you more. She's doing a year long Harvard program and we've seen the abysmal results from just nothing happening in high school and college at most universities when we're looking at a generational change. So we think there's going to be a massive opportunity and new kinds of models for for uh, online learning. Um, uh, there's been yeah, a le learning has really changed. I mean, people don't necessarily have time for the whole uh, traditional path when they when they want to upskill. They're not gonna. You're not gonna um, go back to school necessarily to learn some software that you need to learn. You're gonna find those YouTube videos and um, find things that are designed by skilled instructional designers and um, you know get where you need to go. It's, it's, it's now, it's, um, it's sort of learning on demand now that exists in, in a way that didn't used to exist. Uh, transportation, another huge one. Um, there's this little company you might've heard of Tesla whose stock yeah. going up, uh, what, you know, 16 times or 14 times. Yeah, they're worth more than the other guys combined. <laughs> and uh, we made a mistake because we, years ago, we wrote about this Chinese company and we didn't invest a penny of it. It's called Neo, if any uh -huh. of your listeners. And their stock has gone even up more than Tesla's this year, and they barely sold any cars. Um, so there, there's a lot of speculation, obviously, but there's going to be a real revolution in, in transportation. Susanna has a, a entrepreneur, startup founder friend who pivoted on um, the scooter craze to make a beautifully designed, you know, gorgeous celebrity in endorsed uh, private scooter, you know, your own scooter. The ownership model. So, so it's interesting how some of the sharing models don't you work. You mean like a motorcycle? 
no, no, a scooter, the kind of kick scooter. Like, that like Lime or of, those yeah, other. Yeah, so instead of the scooter share model, which has completely You changed, could always buy one yourself, right? I mean, you could always this, have done yeah, that. Yeah, but this this one, um, check it out. It's called Unagi, uh, like the like the eel, the ja uh, Japanese eel. I think eel. you marked the analogy. Um, it's, it's, it's sort of the apple of scooters, or the, beautifully designed and something that you would really want to own. And yeah. then when you see the, the celebrities like Billie Eilish uh, riding around on her Unagi <laughs> and talking about how great it is, you want it even more. <laughs> yeah, well, the celebrity endorsements, the right ones, uh, make a it's, are, are it's great like for you. an upscale Vespa, I'd say. You know, it's it's it's, yeah. it's it, design is as important as the um, and and we believe in design, so we think there is going to be a lot of opportunity for design. Well, what are your thoughts regarding a bubble in tech with all the stocks that are high price but no product? Isn't that eventually going to blow up? Yes, <laughs> some of them will blow up. Uh, because their kids on, you know, uh, you know, Robin Hood, their kids uh, speculating, um, and um, we were around. Uh, what was it? You know, 19, 20 years ago, right? There was this thing called the dot com crash. Yeah. Um, I, I I do think there are other companies though who who are moving into new models. For instance, like a company I follow is you know, ServiceNow, which is one of these companies sort of building the plumbing for distributed work. So these companies have high valuations, but I think they probably will thrive because they're moving into this very fast growing future at an earlier stage. Have you found that entrepreneurs predominantly have the traits and the archetypes you describe, or do they tend to be a combination of the trails uh, uh, the, I guess, tra uh, trails of several types of archetypes. Well, good question. We, we, we wrote the book uh, wanting to give people a holistic model. So not uh, an exclusionary model or binary model that sort of pigeonholes you into one type. And one of the reasons for this is that I, I grew up with archetypes. My father was a Jungian scholar. So he really was very into this concept of these uh, opposing archetypes, the, the outlaw and the innocent, for example. And then you'd be sort of confused if you found yourself in between. Myers-Briggs, my mother used to give me this test. She was sort of <laughs> the test. I was, a, I was a very introverted teenager, uh, forced to take the Myers-Briggs test dozens of times. And I was always trying to trick it to become the extrovert. So this is something we wanted to avoid. We wanted to uh, help people understand that the archetypes in our model are, are not mutually exclusive. We, we all have elements of all of them. And once you find out what you, which, which one that is your dominant archetype, you can also identify which, arch, which archetype you, you lack. And that can help you to either fill in that gap with someone who's complementary to you or uh, it could be an aspirational uh, model for you to try to embody some of those characteristics of, of a type that you're not. Yeah, um, I happen to be a, a natural athlete uh, type and I have ambitions to grow in terms of the outsider mindset, which you know, the most famous outsiders recently are you know, the founders of Airbnb who knew nothing about hospitality, founders of Uber, nothing about transportation. Um, and so that's sort of more of a learned uh, mindset I'm, I'm studying and trying to grow into. Uh, and you know, part of this comes back to some of the work I did with IDEO where we wanted a human centric approach. There are lots of great books about building your business model, about building your company, but they're organizational. And, we think, you know, especially when we look at this growth of mentors, coaches, people are realizing that the few people who found the company are really, you know, the fuel, the engine, the pistons. And, and so we think hopefully this gives them a better sense of who they are and, and who they'll be working with. Do you think the shared model business like Airbnb that are not pivoting will boom in a year or will they stay down or will change? Well, quickly, I mean, Airbnb, um, I sort of love and hate Airbnb, 
But boy, were they smart because when this crisis hit, they got some cash. And if they hadn't got that cash, remember it was about a billion dollars back early in the spring. They, they traded away some, some equity in order to get uh, some, some big they cash traded, fast. And Susanna, uh, yeah, they traded a lot of equity. Um, and that was the smartest trade they ever made because of course they survived, they went public, they've got a huge amount uh, of, of money and they have also pivoted um, also because they pivoted to longer term stays. You know, a lot of Airbnbs are really short term rentals today. Yeah, um, I mean, there have been companies like this for a long time, VRBO. Uh, I, I, I had a home in Central America and we were using a couple of them before Airbnb came on. It wasn't like it was a brand new concept, but I also wonder how could they ever lose money because they're not, they don't have any assets. You know, mm -hmm. all they're doing is matching people and taking a piece of every transaction. Same thing with Uber. I, I can't mm -hmm. see how these folks can lose money. Well, I think they've shown in San Francisco, they've shown that they're flexible and they've shown, you know, under dire circumstances, they could pivot. Uh, in our book, actually, we profile uh, someone who did a similar thing. They saw the restaurant business being problematic. Their, their parents were had top as restaurants. They were entrepreneurial. They actually studied entrepreneurship. So they created the first major food truck parks in the West Coast. Uh, the first was called uh, Street Food Park and then Spark. And this, this is a, it's a son of a Madriano, so, you know, someone from Spain. And he now oversees 300 trucks and he is a food truck broker. So every time one of his trucks goes to Airbnb or Google or, or you know, any number of these companies, he collects a fee. So again, as you mentioned, he doesn't own the trucks. He doesn't have to hire all these people. And he has different ways of receiving revenue um, with his platform. And you know, another one of our types, um, of our 10 types, is the conductor. So this gentleman, uh, his name is Carlos Muela, is a perfect example of someone who was a conductor who created a platform. Uh, in the book, you mention uh, that you write that success can hold you back. Explain that. So if you have a great job and a lot of security and you've been riding on that big boat for a long time, you may look at people, even people who have been successful with startups and go, you know, why should I take that risk? Um, you know, I might, who knows, I might lose um, the chance to have another great job. And, and so um, a lot of the best entrepreneurs didn't have that huge job. They didn't have millions of dollars in the bank. Uh, and because at some level, they weren't risking as much. Uh, that, that's why we have so many you know, young entrepreneurs and we have entrepreneurs who didn't come from privilege. Uh, we're not necessarily, the, the largest number of startups don't come out of Beverly Hills, for instance. Yeah. Um, so, so, so that's a, a big part of it. And, and I think it's, there is a level of bravery and courageousness to being a successful entrepreneur. I, I wondered in the book, I, I noticed that the vast majority of vignettes were men. Why was that? And is there any differences between the successful women and men entrepreneurs that you noticed? Well, as I said before, I do think that that men can be uh, they can be louder, they can be more vocal about their success and their confidence, and and that that can actually really help them. Uh, but in our, in our in our book, in particular, the one reason we ended up with nine out of the ten entrepreneurs being men is that originally we we had three women that we were going, that we were profiling the book. We met with them dozens of times and had, had many interviews under our belt. They were, they were great, fascinating models. Unfortunately, two of them had to drop out because they were just too busy and they didn't have the time that we would need to properly tell their story. Um, but this wasn't about being, being women. It was just circumstantial. Uh, we do have a thriving network of women entrepreneurs and it only keeps growing. 
My daughter has a global marketing practice and she works with entrepreneurs literally all over the world. And her take on it is, is that uh, a lot of the women don't think global. Like they don't th think in a, uh, in a big way. It's not to say that's a blanket statement because we've seen some of it, but she said she found that more of the women, men entrepreneurs that she worked with were thinking about building global businesses. And a lot of the women she worked with were thinking about uh, building regional businesses. Yeah, we, we agree. There's a great organization uh, we're sort of part of called the Guild. It's a women's professional um, entrepreneurship network. Uh, if any of your listeners are out there, uh, the Guild. And she tells us, the founder of the Guild tells us, you know, women just don't pitch as big. They, they don't pitch with the big scale. Um, they're a little more perhaps, I don't know, honest or modest or uh, and they're not willing to take the same big leaps. That is changing. You know, it's, it's, it's a cultural, it's a cultural change. It's a shift. They're, they're, they're getting the right mentors and coaches. So we think that will change in the next few years. You know, a lot of people think that unless you went to Harvard or Stanford, you can't be successful. Did you notice in your research if the college determine your chances of success? Well, uh, I would say we, we did spend a lot of time at Stanford uh, in our research. And I, I did note that Stanford is kind of a rarefied place with a, a huge network of mentors and investors. Uh, it's sort of hard to go wrong there when you have such a great support system uh, that will give you an advantage. But we've also seen the popularity of, of entrepreneurship programs at other universities, especially here in Silicon Valley. We teach at the University of San Francisco, I mentioned earlier in the uh, Master's of Science in Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Berkeley has some great programs. Uh, what's more important though than your university is the, is the business ecosystem of the surrounding area. Uh, the, that steady pool of investors and uh, support that you'll find in, in the, the market that you want to go into after your university is invaluable. I, I add an interesting sort of side note, though, like at least half of our entrepreneurs were not great students. Um, one was um, virtually a, a high school dropout, but he was studying business as in stealing business books and stealing Forbes magazines at the age of 15 and 16. And he started a venture capital club when he was 21 in college, when he wasn't going to his college classes. We know that sometimes happens. You don't go to your classes. And he got to meet Warren Buffett for an entire day. And he created a fund that was hugely successful. So there's this other element where you have, you know, very smart um, individuals who are focused on business, who start to realize the academic, um, you know, course can pull that away. And, and so uh, we, we tend to see they make this choice early and they realize if I'm too academic, it may harm my entrepreneurial future. Uh, what's your take on Shark Tank? What, what do you think about that show? Uh, you know, I, I think it's done a lot to bring awareness to entrepreneurship. I, I'll say that. I mean, would you encourage entrepreneurs to watch that? Because I think a lot of what they do is right on from, because I run an uh, angel venture fair here in Philly where we get investors uh, and entrepreneurs from all over the world. And they seem to ask like all the right questions. Mm -hmm. You think that's mm -hmm. like a, a, a good show for entrepreneurs to watch well, but, or... Yes, I, I think that the pitch is a really important element of uh, success and will help determine your future success. If you've got the confidence to get out there and really show the kind of leadership and belief in your product that uh, you need to um, have when you're when you're you're going out in front right. of people, um, that that makes all the difference. Yeah, you know, uh, we have. Um... The, you know, a tipping point author, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, has his 10,000 yeah. hours, right? Yeah. And so you watch a lot of Shark Tech and you get your hours in, right? You sort of see um, a, a founder doesn't have the right answer to the investor, you know, they, they're, they're lacking something in their sales, their distribution, you know, their IP, what have you. And one of the things, the first thing you have to learn is they're going to ask tough questions and you have to be able to 
to stand up to that and have good answers. I'm, I'm always amazed that when the, uh, when the uh, um, sharks offer to invest and they want more than the entrepreneur is willing to give up, but they, you would just have enhanced your chances of success greatly. Why, why do you think that they don't take those deals? Well, to, to you know, take this away from Shark Tank, which is which is great, but there is this reality of, of you know, if you're fortunate enough to, to have a good startup, to have investors interested, uh, there is this balance of you know, who do you want to be your first investors because their um, their pedigree matters, right? If you have the right pedigree, it may be easier to get other investment later. So there's the pedigree factor. There, there's also the factor that if you really believe in your model, you may say, why should I give all this equity away, right? When we're going to have tremendous revenue. And, and I think these are all hard questions which need to be discussed with your mentor coaches, you know, your lawyers, et cetera. Um, and sometimes it may make sense to give up more equity and other times to, to hold back. Uh, what percentage mix of the different archetypes are the most successful entrepreneurs? That's a tough one. Well, I, you know, we think of it more in terms of the team. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I would say that uh, there are certain, certain kind of uh, uh, dream team that you might aspire to put together that would have um, a leader, a maker, an evangelist, um, an athlete, mm -hmm. uh, the, to really help you get to where you're going quickly. I mean, to give an example, uh, since writing this book, I've I've become I've come to see archetypes all over the place. And so, when I read uh, the uh, Phil Knight's book, you know, the the Nike founder, Shoe Dog, uh, I was able to quickly note that he's an athlete, of course, he's a leader. Uh, he was a visionary, he built the company, but he also he paired up with. The maker, Bill Bowerman, that, that famous Oregon coach who went on to coach the Olympic team who created the Waffle Soul. So he was always prototyping things. He was a, he was a maker. And then they had the evangelist who got the product out to the track meets around the country and uh, created the first store. So, you know, you want a, a combination of people. I don't, I don't know percentage wise. Uh, everyone needs to have a voice, of course, and be supported by the leadership. Um, yeah, and, and there's another element here. Not all startups succeed. In fact, by far, uh, most fail, right? And, and we talk about this being seven stages. And in our seven stages, if you get to six, you've had some level of success. That's the test stage where you're, you're making money, there's some revenue, there's some growth, and if you're if you're amazing, you scale. You get to seven, and we also see that different types can be more important in different stages. So there, our first stage is, is sort of the awakening and the shift, and that's when it's really ideas and early prototyping. So it'll be a maker for the prototyping. The ideas might come from an outsider. It might come from uh, we didn't really get into it too much, but I think you, you might have been, um, who knows, uh, an accidental, uh, a yeah. famous accidental is uh, Craig of Craig's List, who was just trying to get out of his introverted ways and created a list and it became Craig's List. Um, he had no intention on creating you know, a multi-billion dollar company. So I, I wonder this as we're running out of time here. I noticed you didn't have a concept, or at least it didn't seem apparent to me, called the risk taker. Most people think of entrepreneurs as risk takers. Is that a fallacy? Yes, they are risk takers. And actually, you know, all of these people at some level are risk takers. Some are more than others. Uh, you know, the biggest risk takers would be, we just talked about the outsider, um, a, a, a visionary, um, uh, and, and you know, we talk about this uh, in terms of being able to handle this ambiguity, right? And, and, and I think that may be another way to look at it is people who tend to do well in this entrepreneurial world are okay that they don't have all the answers at the different stages. They're okay that 
the business model isn't completely working or they haven't quite found the target customer or they still need modifications with the product. Now, those are a lot of balls they're juggling up in the air. And when they have the confidence and I think the team, which, which comes from this diversity, they tend to see this as a joy instead of a pain. Well, I have to say, I so enjoyed the conversation with both of you. I'm glad you wrote this book. I think it was very enlightening and clearly the audience really enjoyed it from the number of questions we were being asked because we only got through probably half the questions that I put together for you. <laughs> Thanks again. We look forward to the next book that you write uh, and we hope to have you back. Great. Thanks so much. And, and find us on the entrepreneursfaces.com. All the links to the books are there, the ebook and the print book, and also the quiz that you can take to find out your type. Uh, just when you get to the homepage, the entrepreneursfaces.com, uh, it, it will pop up and you can ask a few, uh, answer a few questions and, and find out who you are and be on your way toward entrepreneurial <laughs> success. Yeah. And we love to hear people. Uh, they they let us know their type and why they're, you know, the evangelist or why they're the outsider. So we'd love we to We all hear benefit from, from this research. <laughs> <laughs> have well, a great you, rest of your day and a great weekend. Everybody have a safe weekend. I look forward to seeing you all next Friday. Thank Take you care. for joining us. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Bye. Pleasure.